Hi there, uh, it's Max again from Isolation Game, and today we're taking on Advanced Stuff, Selectors and Exclusive Gates. Okay, let's dive in. Here we are, deep in the logic department of the Dreams Workshop. I've been conducting some experiments with selectors and exclusive gates. Cuthbert can never make his mind up, so learning these should help. Oh, Cuthbert, what a mess. This is an advanced tutorial, so I hope you've already learned the basics of creating logic. Selectors and exclusive gates are used for choosing different options in logic. The simpler of the two is the selector, so we'll look at that first. In front of Connie is a rotatable bridge, alongside a button that opens the door on the next platform. These arrows are grabbable by the imp. We'll use them to control the selector. Open up the microchip next to Connie. Wow, that's a lot of gadgets. But if we take a closer look, it's actually quite simple. There's three grab sensors on the left. We can tell by the hand icon. The grab sensors detect when the arrow buttons are grabbed by the imp. If you hover over them, you'll be able to see which button they control. On the right, there's four keyframes that store the rotational position of the bridge. Try selecting them and you'll see what I mean. If you select more than one at a time, their effects will average out. You can use the circle button to deselect. To connect the three grab sensors to the four positional keyframes, we're going to use a selector. In the assembly menu, select Gadgets, then open Logic and Processing. Find the selector, then select it with X. Stamp one in the center of the microchip canvas, between the grab sensors to the left and the position keyframes to the right. Then unequip the gadget with Circle. In the next step, we'll set up the selector. That's some complex <laughs> things we have here. So these are the arrows. And these cave arrow glow. Oh. So when you press it, it glows. Number of players required. Aim strength. I don't really get it right now, but I guess another arrow. What's that? Grabber sends a signal when the object the grab sensor is acting is on is grabbed. Uh huh. So this keyframe, what does it do? Oh, it changes. Now stop recording. Arrow glow. So it gives a little bit of glow. Glow is moving. Don't see any glows. Springness. So, um, yeah. I guess it changes only a parameter here on the object, does it? Um, I can't select. Can select it. How do I see the um, properties of this object? 
clone wire. I would love to understand this piece of logic because um, this arrow also can be selected. Maybe they are grouped. This is strange. Okay, let's just leave this as it is and move on. Right, let's focus on the selector. The selector uses input signals to switch between different outputs. Open its tweak menu with L1 and square. The slider sets the number of options the selector can choose from. There are four positions for the bridge, so increase the slider to four. Close the tweak menu with L1 and circle. The selector is much bigger now with lots more ports. On the right edge of the selector, there's four output ports. Create wires on the output ports with R2 or X and connect a keyframe to each one. Make sure you keep the keyframes in order. Now we have four outcomes for the selector to choose from, but how do we switch between them? On the bottom left of the selector, you'll find two input ports that don't have a letter icon. They are move to next <coughs> output and move to previous output. These inputs will make the selector switch between the connected keyframes in sequence. We just need to connect them to the grab sensors for the arrow buttons. Create a wire from the grabbed output of the grab sensor that controls the right arrow. Connect it to the selector's input port for move to next output. If you're getting confused by all these inputs and outputs, just remember, left side of the gadget is inputs, right side is outputs. Now do the same for the left arrow grab sensor and the move to previous output port. Ah, we still need to connect the up arrow's grab sensor. Why don't we use it to reset the bridge? You can directly select outputs by connecting to the corresponding input. Create a wire from the grabbed output of the up arrow grab sensor. Then connect it directly to the A input on the selector. This means that if you grab the up arrow, it will return the bridge to point at the door, regardless of its current position. Now switch over to play mode to try out the controls. Use the arrow buttons to rotate the bridge so Connie can reach the button. Don't try and rotate the bridge with Connie on it though. She's only safe when she's on the blue circle in the middle. Once the door is open and she's back on the blue circle, grab the up arrow button to return the bridge back to its starting position. When Connie is across the bridge, return to edit mode and start the next step. That's cool. Ah. Now we need need another another try. Okay, Connie. Here we are. The next obstacle looks complicated, but is really just a glamorous randomizer. 
there are three trapdoors for Connie to get across. Above each trapdoor is a microchip containing some simple logic. Open up all three with L1 and X. Now click R3 to play time. Notice how the trigger zones detect the balls and open the trapdoors. It looks hectic. It'll be very difficult to get Connie across, if not impossible. Give it a try in play mode if you want to, but whether you manage to cross or not, it's clearly too difficult. By adding some exclusive gates to the logic, we can make this obstacle a bit fairer while still being challenging. Exclusive gate uh. gadgets just take a signal and pass it on. But when you have more than one exclusive gate in a scene, only one of them can be active at a time. So if we add exclusive gates to the trapdoors, then only one trapdoor can be open at a time. Which means that Connie will always have a chance of getting across. Pause the scene with R3 and make sure all three trapdoor microchips are open. Then head into the assembly menu. The exclusive gate gadget is found in the uh, logic and processing menu. Its icon looks like a guard. Sorry, I messed up. I need to bring Connie back. Oh no. I need the bridge. Oh, I need everything to work right now. Again. Okay, so. Another press. And the button and back and uh, a button and we're here okay so back to edit mode everything is not open let the time go Uh, all closed so return a little bit and go the menu the exclusive gate gadget is found in the logic and processing menu its icon looks like a garden gate select it with X stamp an exclusive gate into each of the microchips between the trigger zone and the other gadgets Unequip your imp with circle, then delete all the wires coming from the three trigger zones. In the next step, we'll connect the exclusive gates to the logic. Okay, done. Let's take a closer look at the ports on the exclusive gate. There's a gate input and a gate output port. These ports simply pass through a signal without changing it. But only if the gate is open and only one gate can be open at a time. Connect the detected port of the trigger zone to the gate input port of the exclusive gate. The trapdoor has two possible positions, open and closed, which is set by the two keyframes. But the closed door keyframe is connected via a knot gate. Knot gates are shifty little gadgets. They do the opposite of what most gadgets do, because they're active when they're not receiving a signal. Hello. So when there is not a signal from the exclusive gate, the closed door keyframe gets activated. So, to complete the logic, connect wires from the gate output port and plug them into the open door keyframe and the knot gate. When the exclusive gate is sending a signal, the open door keyframe becomes active, and when it is not sending a signal, the closed door keyframe is active. Now connect up the exclusive gate the same way as in the other two microchips. Each exclusive gate will open only if no other gates are open already. This will stop more than one trapdoor opening at once. 
Click R3 to start time and see how the exclusive gates work. That should make things a bit easier for you to get Connie across to the next platform. Try it out in play mode. Okay. Once Connie is across, return to edit mode and start the next step. It works. Previous challenge, the exclusive gates were fairly simple. But did you know that you can give exclusive gates priorities? Exclusive gates with a higher priority will override ones with a lower priority. This makes the exclusive gate work like a more sophisticated selector. We're going to use exclusive gates to make a timing mechanic to lower the final bridge. Above the meter, there's a microchip. Open it up and we'll take a look at what's going on. Notice that the logic branches from the trigger zone to two different outcomes. One branch goes to a timeline, the other to a keyframe. Take a look at the timeline first. Open up the timeline canvas with L1 and X. On the top two rows of the timeline, there are keyframes that animate the meter. Select them with X to preview them. The meter is just a timing guide for the player. When the button lights up, it's time to hit square. On the bottom row, there's a keyframe to keep the bridge upright. It ends just before the square button keyframe activates. If you take a look at the controller sensor, you'll see the square button output is connected to another keyframe. This keyframe lowers the bridge, allowing Connie to cross. So to lower the bridge, you have to switch from the timeline to the bridge down keyframe. But there's a problem. Both branches of the logic go through an exclusive gate. Open up the gate's tweak menus and take a look at their priorities. The gate to the timeline has a higher priority than the gate that lowers the bridge. This means that no matter what, it will override the exclusive gate that's attached to the controller sensor and the keyframe. To lower the bridge, we need to change the priority of the second exclusive gate, but only when the player hits square with the right timing. We'll do all this with one keyframe. When you're ready, move on to the next step. I already had some experience with exclusive gates in some, in some previous tutorials that I covered. Uh, it's great to cover it up again because uh, I'm already a bit lost because uh, there are so many special logic elements I don't understand. I don't really understand why bridge up has to be uh, as long as it is and why those guys have to be in the end this is strange for me I would rather pre prefer her to explain uh, this whole timeline idea uh, than <laughs> uh, those exclusive gates The timeline's exclusive gate has a higher priority than the one connected to the bridge down keyframe. So there's no way for the bridge down keyframe to be activated. We need to raise the priority of the second exclusive gate, but only when square is pressed with the right timing. We can achieve this by adding another keyframe that modifies the exclusive gate. Go to the animation menu and select the keyframe. 
Stamp one onto the third row of the timeline, immediately after the long bridge up keyframe. As soon as you place it, the keyframe will start recording. While it's recording, go into the tweak menu of the exclusive gate connected to the bridge down keyframe. Increase its priority to 12, so it's one higher than the other gate's priority. When you're done, select Stop Recording in the context menu to store the changes to the keyframe. So now we have an exclusive gate that is priority 10, but can change to be priority 12. Oh, I see now. The keyframe is very short at the moment, so hover over it and hold the up directional button until it fills up the end of the timeline. Now open the keyframe tweak menu with L1 and square. Once activated, we need the keyframe's effects to be permanent. So whoa, select whoa, the Keep stop, Changes stop, stop. option in the Tweak menu. I did something wrong. I want to change only this. Oh, yeah. This works. Great. So now back a little bit, baby. And continue, please. Frame tweak menu with L1 and square. Once activated, we need the keyframe's effects to be permanent. So select the keep changes option in the tweak menu. Now, once the bridge is down, it'll stay put. Close the tweak menu with L1 and circle. This keyframe will be active for half a second when the meter is full. Enough time to hit square and lower the bridge. But look, there's another wire going from the square button output of the controller sensor. This wire closes the upper gate, preventing players from button mashing to cheat the timing. If you press square before you're supposed to, the exclusive gate will close briefly causing the timeline to reset. There are some crafty players out there in the Dreamiverse, so make sure you haven't left exploits in your logic. Time to try out the scene in play mode. If anything's going awry, try following the steps again to see where you went wrong. Once Connie can reach the final platform, breathe a sigh of relief. You've completed this tutorial. My God. <laughs> this is some uh, serious logic here. And I feel a little bit confused. So let me go through it. When you have... Um, been detected there are two separate ways of things to uh, go first a contro controller sensor for the square button uh, if i press square button uh, there are two gates uh, and uh, if i don't press there is just not gate that's okay if i press it um, before the timeline how does this work uh, how does uh, so only this gate works and this bridge down works only when only when what <laughs> Only when this thing's full, yeah? And this thing's glowing. So it doesn't work while this goes up. And only this keyframe key is active only after this works. This is tricky, yeah. 
this is tricky so you have to press only after this plays out oh now I understand that's cool trick I have to remember it well Coney let's go to your strange friend Cuthbert and fly to the multiverse again thanks for watching and uh, be a dreamer <laughs>